All right, hi, thanks for joining me. Today I'm going to be explain, uh, telling you guys about the in vivo leakage sensor we developed. So before I go on, um, the team is made of me, Jinu, and Danny. I'm presenting here by myself. The other two are handling the floor. So firstly, I want to tell you guys, well, why, why do we need this? So in surgery, there are a lot of risks involved. However, most of the risks are actually from post-surgical complications. And leading all the post-surgical complications is internal bleeding, which makes up approximately 77% of all cases, according to 2014 statistics. So it's really important that we detect them because most of the surgical problems come from this. Now, you would think that there'd be current technologies that could deal with this, but in fact, there isn't. And the technologies that are there are quite poor at detecting it or are very dangerous to the body. For example, um, Barium fluoroscopy, that's toxic. You don't want to do that. It, it, it does give you an accurate reading, but it's toxic, it's expensive, and it doesn't give you real time. Um, CAT scans, you don't want to irradiate your patients for obvious reasons. Again, doesn't give, really give you real time. Um, ultrasonography, this can't constantly monitor, so this can't do real time, but this is the best overall option. But still, there's the issue of cost. You have to move the patient from this room to the next. The nurse has to be there, the doctor has to be there, the technician has to be there. The most often used is blood pressure monitoring. The only problem is this is a very poor technique. Oftentimes, it's extremely unreliable. And when it is reliable, let's say your blood pressure drops from here to here, you're probably already in hypovolemic shock. And like I, it's mentioned there, it's probably a little too late. So how do we go about doing this? So the project objectives were essentially, well, we need to develop a sensor that can detect this accurately, get rid of most of the cons, but at the same time, we want to take it one step further and say, we want real-time monitoring. So the sensor requirements, because it's an in vivo sensor, I, the final product ideally, well, we want it to, first of all, detect both gastric leakage and blood and any other fluid, actually, that can uh, leak into the cavity. So before I go on, I quickly want to explain. So in the body, several areas, there are cavities. These cavities are free of free-flowing fluids. They simply have mucus in them. So when it means to internally bleed, it simply means that the, uh, the, the bleeding and the fluids are going into those cavities. Secondly, it has to be biocompatible. But it, at the same time, it has to be stable. Thirdly, it has to be small and light. And lastly, and arguably the most importantly, it has to be cost-effective. So our solution to this is we're not going to use an electrochemical sensor, which is what a lot of current companies and institutions are trying, because that involves using toxic electrolytes. So we said, OK, forget about bringing any extra electrolytes. Let's just use the blood or the gastric fluid or any other, other fluids as part of our detection mechanism. So essentially, we, we decided to use an electrocapacitive sensor. And unlike the other ones, it's 100% specific to all the different types of fluids and doesn't just go for blood or gastric fluid, it does all of them. It's extremely sensitive and it, it's extremely friendly to the body because it doesn't bring in any other foreign substances. So now I'm going to be giving you a quick rundown of exactly how we, uh, we decided that we're going to make this work. So this is at t equals zero. This is, we have two electrodes, all right? So the electrode material is important here because metals have a characteristic work function. Now if you have two different metals of two different work functions, when they're connected electrically, you have a potential between them that's equal to the difference in the work function. So given this, this is t equals zero, the fluid, the leak, just came onto the electrodes, all right? So what happens then is because, the, because now you have an electrical connection, you have a voltage that forms. And all of a sudden, you form an electrical double layer at both electrodes. And this is because once you have an electrical connection, you have a potential that flows, you have a plus and a minus that causes the uh, positive charge carriers to move to this face of the electrode, the negative to that face of the electrode, and then you form two double layers. And as you may know, double layers form as a pseudocapacitor. And what this causes is you have an equivalent circuit of a voltage source, which is due to the difference in the work function, connected to a capacitor, a resistor, and another capacitor in series. And this is actually our readout. So our readout is essentially, if there's no leak, it's an open circuit, you don't get anything. If there is a leak, we get this electrical double layer formation and we get a voltage reading that's due to this circuit. Now, in the case that we wanna draw current from it, we could also do that, and essentially what happens is when you draw current, it 
all the ions and every charge carriers, they basically neutralize and they go back to the original positions, at, what, at which point they could just redo the entire process. But in our case, we don't deal with the current, so we don't need to worry about that. So now I'm going to talk to you about exactly how we design the sensor. So given that we need the two electrodes of different work functions, we need to choose two different metal electrodes. But firstly, we have to make sure they're biocompatible. So we thought, well, why not look at the two most biocompatible metals that are currently used, titanium and platinum. And it just so happens that for our applications, it's perfect because titanium and platinum have one of the largest work function differences. So it was wonderful. So that's good. OK, our electrodes are done. Now, what about the substrate? There are so many different biocompatible substrates. Why choose PMMA like we did? Well, we thought, OK, we want to be able to fabricate this. Well, why not choose a material that's very well known, well documented in microfabrication? So we said, OK, let's use PMMA. We could easily pattern that using E-beam as it's a, it's a positive resistant E-beam. So we decided, OK, let's use PMMA, let's use titanium, let's use platinum. And then we decided, OK, so let's say that um, it's inside the body, it's in the cavity, but the leak, the leak site, because the sensor moving around, was just a little, it's just a little off, so you're getting, you know, blood that's kind of just depositing here. Then what, what you run into the risk of is, well, if it's along here and not really on, it's not cre uh, creating a bridge between these, you're not going to get a signal. So we decided, okay, well, let's have in the middle basically a, a cavity. It's a cavity of sort, but it acts as a capillary action and it pulls the liquid in. Because PMA, of the hydrophilic nature over there, it could pull it in and it just, it's just it facilitates the sensor to become active when there is a leak, when it's not directly on the sensor, let's say. And of course, um, after that, you have to consider, OK, well, now you have the sensor. You have the signal. Well, what do you do with that? And of course, we have to relay that signal. The way we decided we would do that is, well, let's use wireless communication. Because if it's in the body, we can't do wired communication. So it has to be wireless. So then it comes down to two major types of wireless communication. Do you do Bluetooth or do you do RFID? And the, well, it's not exactly obvious, but the preferred would be RFID. Because with RFID, you could do passive RFID, which means you don't need a battery in the body, you could power it externally using you know, modulating fields. However, right now there are some, there aren't very many off the shelf or widely available RFID fabrication techniques, uh, it's passive RFID fabrication techniques. So to do this, it could cost a lot of money or a lot of research. However, Bluetooth, we could use right now because it's very well known, it's very easy to do. The only downside is we have a battery. But this could easily be dealt with because we need to cover the entire circuitry with some sort of cover, a polymeric cover such as PI. So it would all be enclosed and it shouldn't be an issue regarding biocompatibility there. So this is our prototype substrate. Of course, because we couldn't fabricate, we simply machined. So this is uh, it's like an eighth inch thickness PMA substrate. As you can see, it's got the in this one, it's got four channels instead of two. And there's the little micro channel thing going across just to facilitate the liquid from coming in. And this is the full setup for the substrate. Unfortunately, we couldn't make it pretty with wires because you can't solder onto titanium. It just so happens. And aluminum is just too difficult. We, we would need a torch, and we weren't comfortable doing such things. So unfortunately, you guys have to deal with alligator clips in this diagram. But uh, essentially, it's the same idea. Our final sensor would be taking this, fabricated onto a small chip of, let's say, half a centimeter by one centimeter. Very small. We could make it smaller. But why don't we? Because we need the surgeon to be able to take this and put it into the body. If it's so small they can't grab it and maneuver it accurately, what's the point? So we want to make it small, but not too small. And yeah, essentially, this is sensor. These are the electrodes. For testing purposes, we, which I'll get to in just one second, we didn't use platinum because to get platinum that Long and thick, it would cost like $5,000. So we used aluminum. And I'll show you, we actually tried a few materials to get to the conclusion that no, platinum is going to be the best for this. And this is our Arduino. But really, this small chip is the important part. That's the Bluetooth chip, essentially, that's doing all the work. All right, so for the testing, well, we had to do a couple of different types of testing. First of all, we had to test what, what should the materials be. So we had to test, OK, the different materials, what kind of different potentials were we getting? And this is what eventually led us to seeing, OK, no, you know what? Platinum is definitely going to give us a really good signal. And secondly, we want to see the stability of the signal, because it's one thing to have a transient signal. It's another thing to have, OK, no, we know this signal is stable. We can trust it. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know what happened. All right. So this is our materials data. So what we did is um, we decided to take 
aluminum and zinc. These are two metals of different work functions, and we want to see how they behave when we put it in, we, when we compare it against titanium. So we did a control using titanium on both sides. If you have the same work function on both sides, you shouldn't get anything. And in fact, we don't. That's just the noise floor, essentially. When we use titanium aluminum, we get around 340, 350 millivolts. And when we use zinc, we get around 565 millivolts. And these were repeated measurements over you know, five trials. And essentially, we saw that we looked at the work function, relative work function of these metals, and we saw, well, zinc has a higher work function than aluminum. And we actually did a quick test with uh, a, a, a platinum foil. And we see that it's well over one volt for, for the potential between them. All right, so like I was explaining, um, the voltage you get in this system, um, not the voltage you read, because the voltage you read has to do also, it dissipates through the capacitors and the resistors, but the intrinsic voltage between in the system is determined by the difference in work functions. So these are the different materials to be used. So they're in bold. It doesn't have to be titanium platinum. Titanium carbon can be used. But the problem with titanium carbon is microfabrication techniques can't really deposit carbon very well. Um, I don't actually know if they can. Last time I checked, they couldn't. Um, but platinum is very good. Gold, you can also do, as you can see, the work function for gold is pretty close to platinum, the lower bound, at least. But, it's, uh, but platinum is a little more inert and s stable than gold. Gold has some problems with its softness and such. All right, and last thing I want to show you guys, well, last few things, is the actual time signal data. So as you can see here, this is a 50-minute run. I had a run going for 24 hours, but that computer crashed, so unfortunately, I don't have that. Um, as you can see, we started around like 480, and there's a bit of a charging, and then it discharges a bit, but then it stays relatively you know, stable over the course of the rest of the 35 minutes. So you can see that the signal is quite stable. It does fluctuate a little bit up and down, but Overall, it's quite stable at around the 350 mark, and that's actually what you saw in the table just, uh, that, that I just showed you a few slides ago, that you know, these values are corresponding. It isn't just some other mechanism happening. Lastly, I just wanted to show you, okay, well, how do you know there's some sort of capacitor? Could it be something else? Well, we did a test, and we basically said, okay, well, if it's not a capacitor, we should see a step. If it's just the potential between the two metals, we should see a step function. But in fact, we don't. When we ground it, when we ground the entire system, when we let it go, we see this charging phenomenon. It's really quick, but we see a charging. So we can say that, OK, no, it is actually a capacitor. And we did some other few tests to determine whether it was capacitance. We measured the capacitance of the, of the system. And we, we got values that basically point to, no, it is a capacitive charging. And essentially, it'll charge around, it'll, it'll charge to around like 450, 460. And then it'll come back down, and it'll plateau and get stable around the 350 range. And lastly, I want to talk to you about, well, this is all great, but it needs to be cheap. Otherwise, we can't use it. So the actual cost of the prototype, as you can see, is $79, but 75 of that was using the Bluetooth module and the Arduino. So taking that out, it's about $4 or $3. But the cost of microfabrication in bulk, so this is a rough estimate, but this is considering the fact that you can make several of these um, sensors on a single, sub, uh, single wafer, a single run. And the fact that when you do deposition of platinum, it, for example, it doesn't matter if you do a small sample or a big sample. It, it floods the entire chamber, so it does, the, the cost is the same. It's better to do it in bulk. And the beautiful thing is, because the, our sensors are the same, you could do them all at once. You don't, need, you don't have to do one by one. So we, approximate, we approximated the cost to be about $3, give or take, between, anywhere between basically $2 to $5 per sensor. Thank you very much. Oh, I just decided to put that. Thank you very much for your listening. And, uh, do you have any questions? Questions? So you've got a prototype that's made by the big structures, right? Yeah, so it's out there if you want to see it. It's fully functional. We're getting, we have wireless set up. We're, it's on our phone. I mean, we're getting the data on our phone and everything. So the whole idea is you have like some sort of chip implant and then you put it back <laughs> in whatever cavities yeah. before the surgery. No, after the surgery. So basically, right before you closed up the incision point, right? So let's say you were doing some sort of laparoscopic surgery, for an example. Um, you would do your surgery, and before you close it up, you put it in there. Because that, it's post-surgical leakage, internal bleeding. That's the big problem with... Uh, How are you taking it out? You, well, th that's the idea. You don't have to. If we make it biocompatible and that small, ideally, you shouldn't have to take it out. Well, I, like I mentioned, it's like, let's say, half a centimeter by one centimeter, and it's going to be very thin. It's, uh, we, again, the size is, 
it could be changed, but we essentially want to make it as small as possible, but also letting the surgeon being able to handle the actual. But, but you use as small as possible, the sampling area will be very small too. The, sorry? The sampling area. Right, right, exactly. So that's, that's, so that's the compromise, right? There's a compromise between that and that. But we thought, you know, half a centimeter by one centimeter, that's still large enough. Because you put it under the incision point. So you, try to, you would try to put it at the point where you expect the leak to happen, right? So it, you're not going to start internally bleeding at random points. You start internally bleeding at weakened points. So usually the incision point. So you would put it directly under that, for example. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so you mentioned that you need to shield the electrical components, but you also need fluid to get into your chamber. No, so, so you shield the electrical, okay, so because it's fabricated, they're different layers. So you would, you would cover the electrical components, you could encase them in a polymer, but the, top, the, the actual sensor, you would actually, you actually want to encase the sensor also with a semi-permeable membrane. And this is to prevent, let's say, tissues and other organs from brushing against your sensor and giving you a reading. You don't want that. So by using a semi-permeable membrane, you could prevent you know, uh, the fluid on the, on the organs or, such, or even the mucus along there from penetrating. But when there's a leak, the water and the electrolytes to actually penetrate in. So yeah, you would actually want a membrane on both, but for different reasons. For the electronics, you don't want it to be permeable. You want it to be just a full out enclosing and then for the actual, actual uh, electrodes, you want to put some sort of uh, semi-permeable membrane. Yeah. Just a quick question. I just wanted to follow up with the previous question yeah. about that biocompatibility. You right. said if it's small enough, you don't have to take it out as long as it's biocompatible. Right. But eventually, your body is going to put some sort of capsule just there. Right? right. But so this, again, this is what we would really figure out during the actual testing in animals or whatever. But the this may be naive thinking on our part, but we think that it's small and it's in the cavity. It's not really affecting your body function. And because it's so small, even if it formed a couple of layers around it, it shouldn't pose a problem, right? It's not going to build into some sort of major cancer tumor or anything, so. <laughs> I mean, it's completely back. Like, I mean, and the other thing is we thought, okay, well, titanium implants are used in the body and they last up to 50 years. Platinum is very stable on the order of same order. PMMA is also very stable. So we thought, okay, well, if we combine these already stable components, we should expect, you know, decent compatibility at least. Or that was... Ex what if the battery? Huh? What if the battery? Oh, what do you mean? Uh, the battery. You said the, the machine, uh, the sensor would have a battery, right? Right, right. So, so that's, uh, that's the non-ideal case. The ideal case is to do passive RFID, okay. right? Passive RFID, you could uh, supply the power from external. So yeah, that's, that's the ideal, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, just one comment. Yeah. People have got common conversations the last 20, 30 years. Yeah. You, you were mentioning that they never had it before. Yeah, so um, when we started the project, we talked to a few like a people, like a few surgeons, and some. Uh, we actually uh, contacted Covidian, which is a pharmaceuticals company, and they basically said, yeah, this is a huge problem, and nobody's come up with a solution to this. So. No, no, the common deposition. The what? You mentioned common cannot be deposited. Oh, carbon? Yeah, okay, that could, I don't know that for sure. I, it was just more of a comment that uh, when I asked Professor Bokui, he said, not really, but. No. People have been doing that for the last 30 years. Okay. If you look at carbon, you get a deposit from Broadway to Diamond for the last 30 years. Okay, well, anyways, then you could do carbon instead of platinum. Yeah. If it's cheaper, then that's better, right? So. <laughs> yeah, it's worth it. Okay, okay, sorry, I, that was, I wasn't sure about that, so. Awesome. All right, perfect. Yeah. Hopefully I didn't go too long, right? Okay.